the Boulder Ballet for the past couple of years, putting on these really interesting, um, like, AI sorts of shows where he's been creating instruments that the dancers can all wear and depending on how they move it'll affect the music. Um, and Mike has also been building a synth studio over the past year, which will be up and running perfectly when you guys all get here. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that too. <laughs> but yeah, I'd say the first two years you have your audio class, but you're gonna feel a lot like you are a jazz or a classical major. I remember my freshman year in particular, I felt like I was doing a lot more of that, but then that comes back to be a huge perk later in college because then you find out like, wow, all this music theory I know and arranging knowledge and ability to like play well, know what's in time, know what's in tune, that's all, those are huge assets when you're an engineer. And a lot of engineers don't have the same musical proficiency that you'll walk out of Lamont with. Yeah. Um, yeah, because when, yeah, when, you, well, okay, when you're sitting in like in the, in the studio engineering a session, um, do the, those artists don't necessarily have someone with them to, to listen, to not just be playing, but to listen and be that other set of ears. So that's you, right? you're mm -hmm. the person who can be like oh you know what no somebody like squeaked that note or somebody was playing a little out of tune on that last take i think we might want to do it again those kind of like yeah, it, skills i think the when i really knew that it was helpful it was at my um first internship i was working at a studio in evergreen uh called evergroove and both of the engineers that ran that studio were incredible engineers but they couldn't, they weren't players, you know, they were engineers. Um, and I remember a couple, more than a couple times, basically every time we were recording vocals, then the singer was like, all right, time for harmonies. What are we doing? And I was in a room with a couple people kind of shrugging, like, what do we do? And I was, I was, I got to be the harmony guy. And then uh, same thing with writing horn parts. Um, yeah. So you can kind of bridge the gap between engineer and producer a little bit. Yeah. Cool. Effect, especially in Colorado. Yeah. So, um, what did uh, have you done your final project yet? Yeah. Okay. So, what did you do? Tell us about your final project. Uh, the final project is actually pretty open ended. It's just two hours of your best recorded music that you did, um, you know, the whole time you were in school. Mm -hmm. So, and like, if you're working hard, two hours is it, it's nothing. Like, I only, I only think I used stuff for my junior and senior year, but I had, I had one punk album, an electronic EP, a jazz album, a couple, I had like three indie albums. Um, yeah, like you can kind of pick what you do. It's just what you think is most Oh yeah, and I had a pop album too. Yeah. But um, you can pick whatever you think shows off your versatility the best. Yeah. Um, but it was really, honestly, it felt really good. I, I put this together like last week, so it's, that's a fresh okay. project. Oh boy. Well, yeah, and it's, I don't know, it was awesome like seeing a Spotify playlist. Of, like, wow. I've done a lot of stuff over the past couple of years. <laughs> oh man. Well, I feel like we're going to get so many great questions and we're already starting to get a couple of Good questions. Um, and I know people are going to ask, and just, just still on the curriculum thing for a second, um, the internship. So did, um, did Lamont help you find an internship? And what did you end up doing? Um, I went, I kind of did two. Um, I, my first one was at Evergroove because I, I wanted to spend my first summer in Colorado. And I knew that I wanted to stay here for a little while. So I didn't want to like go to New York or something. Um, but DU definitely helps. Both of the teachers have some connections and there's a couple studios that like students have gone to in the past. So you can like when you're a freshman, sophomore, you'll be friends with all the juniors and seniors and you can ask them like, hey, what do you do for that? Um, and depending who you are, because I think both Matt and Mike are really good at you know, teaching everything that you definitely need to know, but also listening to what you're into and what you want to do. 
So like I had one friend who was much more into um, like actually like the electrical engineering side of everything. And he was like building his own pedals and soldering his own cables and stuff like that. So he had an internship working, oh, what's the company? It's like a local like modular synth company in Denver. Oh, I should know that. But, um, you know, but I wanted to, I want to be working in studio. So I got my internship at a studio. Um, yeah. yeah. But um, do you help? And also, like I emailed, I emailed probably like a hundred studios and people got back to me all over the place. Like I could have gone to New York. I could have gone to Nashville. Yeah. Which I, I'm, I'm going to make my way over there post COVID, but. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, so just to get to, you know, one of our, one of these good questions that has come in so far, um, Manuk um, Paglion is asking, is it important to already be good at recording and production to be accepted into the program? I've been performing music much longer than I have been recording and production. How might that affect my application and auditions? So if you could just speak to Kevin, like the, maybe the level of preparation, the level of skill you felt you were at when you applied to the program. Um, I mean, I was in, a, I think a lot of students are in a very similar boat to you where you've been playing music for a long enough time where, you know, you want to get kind of a little bit more behind the scenes with it. Um, like I started playing music when I was like six or something. And before college, I was like a bedroom producer. Like I started using logic when I was probably like a sophomore in high school. Um, but, you know, in the program, there's some students that have known they want to be a recording engineer their whole life. And there's some students like who realize that's what they wanted to do their senior year of high school. I think it's more important to just show your aptitude and dedication to the craft um, more so than like where you're starting. Yeah, um, great. Um... Another question of what, what DAW digital audio workspace do you use? Nicholas is wondering. These days I'm using, it depends on the project, um, Logic, Pro Tools, and Ableton. Um, yeah, they all have their pros and cons. So depending what the group is and what they're trying to accomplish, I'll use those. Or sometimes I'll use multiple DAWs on the same project and like move my files around. Um, yeah. Yeah, you'll, you'll learn, you'll definitely learn Pro Tools at DU. Um, we do some stuff in Logic, and then I started trading piano lessons for Ableton lessons to pick that up. Um, and then uh, what hardware DAW plugins do you learn on? Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can learn on any of them, because the more you learn about each of them, you realize that they're all pretty similar in a lot of ways. Uh, I learned on logic with no hardware other than an interface and i was using um just like the logic plugins and some native instruments plugins uh like guitar rig and whatnot but you can learn with anything yeah cool well I'm so pleased to introduce uh, Mike Schultz, the founder and director of the uh, Bachelor of Music and Recording and Production. Hello, how are you? Hello, I apologize for being late, but I'm here. We've we've um, we've just been chatting and having uh, you know a bit of an informal Q and A. We've been getting a lot of great questions, um, and um, in fact. Uh, I think this next one I want to punt to you, uh, Mike Schultz, um, because I'd love for you to talk about how this program got started, the history of it, because you were the one who started it. So Annika Erickson, Annika Erickson is asking, when was this major developed? So take us back to, to when you started that. Sure. First of all, I'll show you I'm in my home studio, and there's a whole bunch of synthesizers over there analog synthesizers, keyboards, drum machines, so on and so forth. Um, I, uh, I started out as a trombone player at University of Illinois uh, and got into jazz, uh, became a jazz musician. Um, uh, while I was there, uh, I uh, worked for the audio production department where I learned uh, to be a recording and live sound engineer. 
also was able to take electronic music classes uh, at the University of Illinois um, Experimental Music Studios. So I started in a modular analog synthesis. This was the early days of MIDI, analog recording, reel-to-reel, -reel, mostly classical music and a little bit of jazz back then. Um, I went to, uh, uh, upon graduation, I was hired at Oberlin Conservatory in Ohio, uh, where after a couple of years, I became director of audio services. So I ran their whole audio production uh, department there and taught uh, an audio engineering class for them for about 10 years. So after that, uh, I was hired here in 2003 at University of Denver. And at the time, the this degree was a, a concentration within the jazz studies degree. So I taught two years worth of classes only to um, jazz majors, uh, audio engineering classes. Uh, after a couple of years of that, um, I changed the, uh, the prerequisites to the class so that classical students could get into the classes as well. And after a few more years, which I think has probably been about 10 years ago, um, we actually set it up as its own freestanding Bachelor of Music degree and got that all uh, approved with the National Association of Schools of Music. So the, the self-standing degree is about 10 years old right now. Very cool. Um, so Jess Maltzman is asking, what is the environment like within Lamont? Um, Kevin, do you wanna maybe uh, attest to that as a student? How would you describe that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think and there's a reason I stayed. <laughs> um, no, it's very friendly. I've been, I'm much more familiar with the jazz side of things. Um, there's, there's definitely some commingling between the jazz and the classical um, students, but they tend to, it, there does seem to be a little divide, I think, because we take different um, like we have different ensembles and we have different uh, music theories, but we all take musicology together and there's some fusion projects that'll, you know, go both ways. But I think what I've really liked about Lamont is everyone is really dedicated to whatever craft they're studying at Lamont. But the more you get to know people, everyone has their own interests and their own creativity and their own kind of like things that they're learning on their own and using what they learn at the mind to like better whatever project that they're working on. Um, I think that it's a really creative environment all around. Yeah, uh, and what art, hey, what artist name do you go by? Cause Aiden would like to listen to your music. I haven't put any of my own music out for a while. I'm, <laughs> I'm an engineer, but um, I, I can, I'll type out some band names that are Denver bands that I've worked with um, yeah, I'll just put it in the chat. If that's all right. Yeah, cool. Go for it. Um, so we got a couple questions about um, the audition and application requirements, which I'm going to actually bring up a slide to talk about now. But first, um, Mike, how many students are in the recording and production program and how many do you accept every year? We uh, used to take only about four or five. Uh, but we recently uh, got a hold of a few new rooms and uh, one or two very generous gifts for equipment, which enabled us to open up three electronic music studios, which were just about to open when COVID hit, that it's all on hold right now. But by fall of this year, those three studios will be open and the extra space has allowed us to accept between five and 10 per year right now. I think there's somewhere between 50 and 20 majors in the in the program that's going to start to increase a little bit. That's awesome. Cool. Okay, I'm going to bring up, um, I'm going to share my screen and bring up these um, requirements. So time to talk requirements. Um, so as we've been talking about how this is a, a combined recording arts degree and performance degree or music degree, there is, um, there's multiple parts and multiple things you have to submit. So you have to satisfy the um, audio demo portion of the application. So your materials that um, Professor Schultz is going to be um, examining for the recording 
and production part of it, you also have to pass an audition in a musical area of study or submit a composition portfolio if your musical area of study is classical composition. So um, you'll see when you apply, you'll have these checklist items and depending on what you put down as your musical area of study, um, it'll say either um, Lamont audition video or um, composition portfolio. Um, and if you're jazz composition, you have to both audition and submit a portfolio. Um, so for those, uh, for that recording and production portfolio, that checklist item, it's actually three things kind of rolled up in one. And it's those three things you see there, the, the um, starting with submit at least one audio recording that you have uh, engineered by yourself. Um, and I'm going to have um, Professor Schultz talk a little bit more about um, sort of the most successful applicants in a second here, but let me just go over the other couple things. Um, we also want a one to two page technical explanation of um, how and why you recorded, mixed, and mastered your recordings. So the, the how and why you did what you did and what you used to do it, um, including the type of pressing. Um, and then we want a statement, you know, nothing more than a page, maybe a paragraph or two paragraphs, outlining your future plans and reasons for seeking admission to the program. So this is specifically to why you want to be in recording and production, and it's separate from the essay that you're going to write for the, the Common App or the um, Pioneer App. Um, okay, so this next slide, this is um, a little bit more about the audio demo. So Professor Schultz, do you want to um, just kind of talk more about what uh, what you're looking for in a successful audio demo? Yes, I, I think there's a typo on that last slide. The type yeah. of pressing, I, th I think that was supposed to be something to do with compression. Okay. Um, I'm going to modify a little bit what it says because this is... Um, this is evolving. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll go back to the difference between uh, classical and jazz composition. Um, that difference is starting to shrink. And I would encourage anybody who hasn't actually done any classical composition to go ahead and apply. If you uh, create, record, write, produce popular music, we have students in the classical composition uh, studios who are doing that right now. Um, same thing in jazz. We, we kind of look at, uh, you know, the classical jazz thing is a continuum and there's room in the middle for people who don't necessarily do those traditional, traditional things anymore. Uh, what I'm looking for uh, in the separate submission for audio engineering is um, something that it can involve electronic and digital sources as well as microphones, but I would much rather have at least some uh, microphone or real instrument sources in there with the electronics, some vocals, some guitar, some bass, some drums. Um, if you submit something that is completely electronic, uh, it's hard for me to tell um, how that was done, because it's really easy these days just to pull some samples out and, and kind of do that without putting much time into it. So I encourage you to encourage uh, real sources along with electronic sources. Um, yeah, and that can be, uh, you know, a rock band. It can be an electronic track that you did with a couple of vocal tracks recorded on top of it. It could be a recording of a classical or a jazz ensemble. Um, and, and the technical description of how you did it, uh, what input devices, microphones, direct sources, uh, what kind of EQ and compression you did, just so I can read through there and tell that um, you went through a process and you did things intentionally and uh, were trying to achieve a specific goal. Cool. Thank you for that. Yeah, you know, this is one of those, um, this is a, a, a major that requires, it has a lot of different pieces for the application. And I know that we, we get a lot of questions about that. So it's good to hear from you, like what exactly um, is qualifies as a complete application and portfolio. So, okay. So, um, 
so Annika, I hope that um, answers your question about, um, oh, Annika, actually, let's clarify this. Um, she's wondering, is it a one to two page explanation for each song? So she's, if we're, they're submitting multiple songs it, or one to two page explanation total for all of the demo? Oh, it, for all of the demo is fine. Um, yeah. Great, okay. And then um, Josie, I think I think we covered that in the slides. Um, uh, uh, deadline question. Yeah, January fifteenth. Tomorrow is the deadline. Um, I will say, you know, we um, we're going into the weekend, and um, our staff is probably not going to really get to look at things that come in um, until Tuesday, since Monday is a holiday. So. Um, just kind of saying that to you on the down low, um, if you want to get your, get your stuff in this weekend and, um, spend that time with it. So, okay. Um, Lane Randall is wondering how often do you work with composition students to record their original works? What a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, well, the composition students they'll have their own concerts throughout the year and every concert that happens and recital that happens at Lamont gets uh recorded by one of the engineers on staff like me or uh, there's a couple other um engineers that will record those um but for more produced things I personally haven't recorded any of the like actual composition majors but that would be up to you just like you know, making friends and connections and talking with the composition students. Um, and you could totally do that if that's what you're trying to do. That's, yeah, and that, that's open. Uh, all the uh, recording production students are required to come up with various music production projects every quarter. And there's a lot of networking that goes on in the School of Music. So the thing to do is to get to know the students in that major uh if you're not in that major and just kind of make sure they know what you're doing uh we also have some interesting things since it sounds like we've got some composition people here uh we're starting up a new collaboration with the film studies department they they have a project called uh, project du film um and they uh every other year they produce a film uh between students faculty and alumni and starting this year, the project will start in the fall and finish in the spring. Starting this year, the music will be composed by Lamont students. The music will be recorded and produced by Lamont students. And um, the final uh, audio post-production for the film will also be done by Lamont students. And this will be an ongoing thing. Um, we are also, kind of doing the same type of project around music videos. They, they uh, the film studies department did a music videos production class for their majors for the first time. And um, they are also looking for music from uh, Lamont uh, students to build music videos around instead of using uh, tunes that are out there by big time artists. That is super cool. Awesome. Um, okay, Nathan Grammer is wondering, um, maybe this is a Kevin question, how do you feel this program has helped you develop your audio engineering skills, both in regards to working with other artists and with your own projects? I mean, it's helped tremendously. Um, I mean, for starters, I had never really worked on an actual board and, you know, used microphones worth more than my life. So, I mean, just like in here, like just the gear that you have access to and you can experiment with, you know, as long as you're nice to, um, that is like unparalleled by any like internship kind of opportunity that you could find um, to just be able to experiment and see, like record the same source with six different microphones and see how they vary. Um, so then in the future, you know, like, oh, well, I'm going for that sound, so I'll use this microphone. But um, and then in regards to working with other people, like I don't know what kind of musical environments you have at your high schools or your communities, but I had never just been thrown into a building with like, I don't know, three, 300 musicians, something like that. And everyone is super talented and has dedicated all their time, at least right now, to playing music. So um, 
I mean, there's just so many musicians to work with. And the more you get to know each other, you realize like what each other's strengths are and how you can put together more large scale projects. Um, yeah, and you do that a couple of times with, you know, some friends you've made and then some people that you don't know will reach out to you. And that's when I really started learning how to work with other artists is when I was recording people that I, like I met them the day of the session, you know, maybe we emailed a little bit, but I think DU just provides a great space and technical knowledge where you can definitely like you can get people to want to work with you and then you can you can do it you don't need to rent out a studio space to um you know that which would cost probably like 300 bucks at least for a day you can just invite musicians i mean obviously not during COVID times but you can invite musicians that you meet throughout denver um and work with them and you'll see how your role will kind of vary with different groups and different projects um, because different people want you to do different things and you get to be a chameleon that can do it all. Very cool. Uh, uh, Angela, can I jump in real quick and yeah. just a little bit of more clarification about the engineering demos. Please. Um, a, a bad thing to do is to go rent a professional studio and send me something uh, that was done in a commercial studio that sounds absolutely fantastic because I can't tell um, if you did all that all. I would much rather have some, one of the best demos I ever got. Uh, this was Colton Sparks. Um, he recorded four piece rock band with him playing all the instruments, one instrument at a time. And he had a single microphone, which was a $99 Shure SM57. So he got a decent drum sound with one cheap microphone and it wasn't even in stereo. And then he did bass and guitar and another guitar and vocals. Um, and I could tell that it was uh, done with cheap and limited equipment, but it ended up sounding pretty darn good that way. So I would rather hear you do what you can do with what you've got um, so that I can tell that it's really you. And if that doesn't sound like something that you could put out on a record, that's okay. Cool. Yeah. So, um, uh, Annika, Annika is wondering if you've already applied to be a vocalist, could I change to apply for classical composition? Yes, Annika, no problem. Annika, I'm going to put my email address in the chat. You can also see it behind me. Please send me an email so that we can just have a written record of that. Um, and then, Manuk is, Manuk wants a little bit more information about what you're looking for in the technical explanation. He says, I know very little about mixing, not quite sure how to describe what I did with the EQ. I was gonna add pictures of the EQ for each track, but it made the paper too many pages long. What's the best way to describe how I mixed and um, panned my work? Let's do the best you can. That's my answer. You could put some pictures in there. If you do that, tell me what, what the thing sounded like before you applied that EQ and why you ended up with the picture that you ended up with and what it sounded like after you did it. Yeah, yeah, good rule of thumb is, you know, does it make sense logistically to you to read it and uh, maybe get, get another person to read it and if it all makes sense and everything's spelled right, then Sounds good. All right. Um, what kind of gear do students have access to? Lane Randall is wondering, do students have access to studio time outside of class? You do. Um, when you're in the program, uh, in the first year, the freshman year, most of what you're going to be doing is on your own laptop until uh, winter or spring quarter, where we'll do some kind of a class recording session. And um, at that time, you will have access to one of the uh, studios over at Wesley Hall, uh, the, new, the new studios, the electronic studios, which are also really great mixing rooms. So winter or spring quarter, you'll be working in a studio mixing something that we recorded as a class. Um, at that time, you'll also be able to start doing um, whatever you want to do in those electronic studios. And um, it, it's a setup bigger than the one I've got over here. It's uh, drum machines, analog synthesizers. We have a very expensive Moog One 
uh, 16 voice analog synth, uh, more keyboards, uh, stereo and surround monitors, uh, subwoofer, uh, analog modular synthesis. We'll have uh, analog video modular synthesis over there. It's a really impressive space. Um, starting sophomore year, we do more in the Lamont Recording Studio. Uh, Post-production mixing then happens in that studio as well as the mixing and mastering studio, a uh, different room at the School of Music. Um, usually in the sophomore year, we're able to incorporate your own music. Um, uh, my sophomore class and my junior class have bands kind of between them. And those bands are their primary recording projects right now. So they're working up their own music. Uh, and once you get to senior year, you are working relatively unsupervised in the studios. At that point, you can start even bringing in um, outside musicians, outside bands to record. What I ask is the, the rule is you can't do anything and charge people money. You can't do anything where there's any quid pro quo. Hey, I'll paint your car if you record my band. No, that we we discouraged that's against the rules. Um, but that's not going to be a problem because there's so much going on and there's so much opportunity to do uh, the music that you want to do. Um, and we'll assign you some stuff to some some jazz and some classical stuff. And by that time, probably some sound for picture stuff. So yeah, you you'll get in there in the freshman year and kind of work your way into the rest of the facilities over the four years. Cool. Uh, Carter Briannis is asking, what does the composition portfolio entail? Carter, I'm putting in the chat the link to the composition studio that explains those uh, requirements in detail. Um, again, this would be separate from the recording and production portfolio, and this would satisfy your musical area of study if that happens to be classical composition. Um, real quick, that's two to three um, compositions represented by scores and or recordings. And you can read all about that on the um, on that link. Um, uh, Tara Russick Robbins asking, uh, can you talk about the music scene in Denver? Go for it, Kevin. Uh, you know I want to. Oh, it's awesome. It's <laughs> it's um, yeah. I've really enjoyed it. It's I think a great city to you know kind of you know get in get involved with because it's not as intimidating as like LA or New York but it's more like I like the music scene here and I think it's a lot more thriving here than it was in Baltimore um, but it's super varied a lot of different kinds of music are getting played and uh, one thing I've always really loved about Denver is like you'll you'll be playing some show and there's one or two other bands on it and there's oftentimes like pretty varied bills where each band is super unique, but also super talented in their own respect. Um, and that's like something I wouldn't really find like back in home, at home. Um, like I'll play in like a neo soul band and then like a math, like a math rock band will play after us and a funk band before or something. Um, and that's a totally normal night at Laramie Lounge. And there's, a lot of venues that are um, approachable, I'd say. Like you, you know, you definitely have to have a product worth them presenting, but it's completely within reason to be playing at, there's probably like a dozen venues I'll play at with some consistency. And, you know, once you do well at those venues, it seems like every venue is kind of in the know of, of what's happening at the others. And you can kind of like move up these tiers until you're playing at Red Rocks. Um, <laughs> but I've really enjoyed the, the music scene here. And it intersects a lot with the art scene, which for me, I, I think is super cool. It gets back to what I was saying about both Lamont and Denver at large, I feel are just incredibly creative cities. Like anywhere you drive, there, no building doesn't have a mural on it, at least not down in Rhino. Um, All right, yeah. yeah. That's what I think of it. <laughs> um, okay, so 
Mike Lane Randall is wondering, um, so he's looking to transfer to Lamont, currently have access to a studio with nice equipment at his school. Um, should he, can he use that? Is that okay? Or should he try something else? No, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Um, what I mean by the professional studio thing is uh, don't go out and rent a professional studio where there's a staff engineer who's going to help you on the session. Whatever you submit, all engineering is done by you. All recording, all mixing, mastering, if you've done it. Nobody else has done any of the engineering but you. All right. Amachi Smith-Hill uh, is asking, do we have access to orchestras or symphonies that can play and maybe record our music with us? Uh, in the composition major, at the end of every school year, the Lamont Symphony Orchestra does a recording session uh, where all the composition students get a piece of theirs recorded in the uh, orchestra rehearsal room. Uh, so it's like a studio recording session. There's also, uh, uh, I believe there's an orchestra concert where one or more compositions, student compositions are performed. Am I right about that, Angela? Uh, yes, the, it's what, every quarter, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is it recording, or sorry, Jacob Speth is asking, is it common for recording and production students to study abroad for a semester? Have any of them done that? It is, and um, the only difference between that and everybody else is because of the way the curriculum is set up, uh, my majors do it in the fall quarter of senior year instead of junior year. And uh, I've had students go to London, um, Sydney, I think. Uh, where else, Kevin? Where, where did people go? You know, it's- Didn't do it this year because of COVID, but- um, Athena went to Estonia. I wouldn't, I'd say it's not super common, but it's also um, very possible to study abroad. Like if that's something that's important to you, I, I didn't because like, you know how Mike was saying your senior year, you kind of get into, you can do whatever, you, you can record whatever you want in the studio. So I figured, you know, I only have what, nine months of this. And then for the rest of my life, I need to buy expensive gear, rent expensive studios. So I wanted to stick around and I'm happy I did because I didn't, you know, I didn't get much of the rest of that year due to COVID. <laughs> But, uh, I'm remembering too that we had uh, Athena went to Estonia and went yeah. to a really cool place. So I forget the name of the school, but she did uh, electronic music and sound design and some classical recording. So, yeah. Oh, and didn't Diego go to Glasgow? Yeah, he did. Yep. Yeah. Went to Scotland. Apparently, Glasgow is very cool. Mm -hmm. you know, a bunch of people that have been there. Yeah, in case in case y'all don't know, DU is ranked like top ten for our study abroad program. Um, it as in the percentage of our students who study abroad were like in the top ten. It's a big thing at DU. So um, this is an interesting question. Okay, Annika Erickson is asking. Um, okay, if I'm applying for recording production area of study composition, and the songs I'm submitting for recording production are songs I've also written. Could I use those same recordings to satisfy both requirements? Um, yep. Professor Schultz, do you think so? Yes, you can. Yes, okay. So um, so Annika, when you email me about switching your um, area of study, just um, mention that in there so we can make sure that we get, you know, get your, um, your pieces reviewed by the right people. Okay. Um, well, we are kind of, um, oh, Carter, yes, we can, we can get you changed. Um, again, Carter, I'm going to put my email address in the chat. Please email me to take care of that. Um, I just want to have this in writing. Um, just, uh, I'd love, you know, any more questions we have in the seven minutes remaining? Um, I'll ask you guys, I'm very curious, how has COVID disrupted your lives, <laughs> your year in, in your recording work? So yeah, Mike, have, has the, how has the recording program been running this year in the face of COVID? 
Oh, asking me that? Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, no, it's okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's worked out. Uh, we got lucky. It's worked out pretty well. Um, the, the first year students, um, the first fall quarter is usually just you working on your laptop anyway. We, we start with mixing right away. So that, that helps you with stuff that you're already working on. If we start by mixing, then you can go back to your own stuff and improve it right away. Um, in uh, uh, this quarter, we then move to microphones and we're able to do some microphone uh, demos online. I'll be demonstrating uh, single and stereo microphone techniques here in my studio with acoustic guitar. Um, students are also moving into virtual instruments and starting to build up their own tracks. Uh, in spring quarter, we'll do a synthesizer programming module. So that's all stuff that works really, really well online. Uh, the upper class students already had access to the studio sophomore and up. So they've been able to go in in small groups with the masks on and uh, and work on projects by themselves. And I'm, I'm kind of coaching them. I'm at home, they're in the studio, we're on Zoom. I'm helping them during their session. So it's worked really well. And by everything we can tell, uh, by the time you guys show up here, this should be mostly behind us. We may all still be required to wear masks and do some distancing, but we're hoping people will be vaccinated and that we'll be able to get all back in person. But like I said, that fall quarter is, is kind of online anyway, so it's not gonna disrupt very much from here on out, I hope. Great. I have some, Angela, I have some cool pictures um, I could show in just a minute if. Yeah, if, go for it. Do you wanna just share your screen? Uh, screen share. Um, this is just some stuff from over the years. Uh, these are three students. Um, that's a big modular analog synthesizer in the back. This is Studio A control room. Uh, that synthesizer has been moved over to the new Wesley Studios. Um, guitar player in the recording space of Studio A uh, with a really cool pedal board. Uh, a couple of amplifiers in the closet. Um, Miked up close with dynamic micro. Oh, this is a session that I did. This is um, one guitar player with stereo effects going to going through uh, two separate uh, vintage Ampeg tube amplifiers, mid sixties Ampegs. Uh, there's that's him uh, taking a selfie in front of the synthesizer. That's a nineteen uh, seventies uh, vintage ARP twenty six hundred synthesizer on top. Uh, this is Brandon Meager. This is a drum set recording in the orchestra rehearsal room. This is a beautiful room that we have. It's gigantic. The orchestra rehearses in there. And at night, we get to go in there and learn how to do big, huge stadium drum sounds the way that they used to be able to do back in the day when there were lots of huge recording studios like um, like the Hit Factory and Cello and Ocean Way. A lot of those studios have closed down because the the it's hard to be profitable that way, but we can have that experience of the big giant rock and roll drum sound recording. The rest of the band is in the studio. Everybody's on headphones and he's tracking drums. Uh, some really nice outboard gear in Studio A, a studio dog right there. Um, student mixing, this is a long time ago. These screens have been replaced. This. Um, Mixing console, this is a controller that's gone in the place, this whole table here. I don't have a picture in front of it right now, but if you go to the website, I believe the uh, picture has been changed. We now have a big uh, 48 input API analog console, $100,000 analog mixing console with automation that we just installed about a year and a half ago. Uh, so control room looks a lot cooler than what you're seeing here. Uh, 5.1 monitor system. Uh, which we moved into Studio B. Studio A is stereo, Studio B is 5.1. Uh, this is, um, oh, I am ashamed to say I forget his name. Kevin, who is this guy? Uh, he's a uh, luminary on the Denver music scene. He's involved with Youth on Record. Uh, I believe he uh, was involved with the band Flowbot. Um, Before my time. And he's, uh, he's talking to some students here about uh, popular music 
production and how to run and market a band and book gigs. Uh, this guy is the drummer in a Rush tribute band that we brought in for a student recording project. And he is awesome. And he has an exact duplicate of one of Neil Peart's uh, standard uh, drum sets. They're not recording uh, Rush covers in the session, but he, he brought the, uh, well, he's only got one kick drum. Okay, so it's not the Neil Peart, but that's what he does and he was awesome. So uh, we, we bring in, sometimes we'll just bring in a local working band uh, to be the class recording project that we try to do like in the freshman year. This is a, a showcase. We did a takeover at Herman's Hideaway, which is a pretty big music club. Sadly, that closed recently due to COVID, um, but we took over the whole place. We had uh, four bands, uh, two of them all DU students, the other two lots of DU students, people that had graduated and have bands. We did a, um, an audio and a video shoot of the whole thing. Um, you'll see another picture of that. This is Robert Wolf uh, a couple of years ago doing a, a lecture for us. Robert Wolf is um, uh, John Williams music editor. So Robert Wolf did all the music editing on the last uh, a, a, a Star Wars movie. I forget which one he did it. He's done editing on recent Star Wars movies. He did the music editing on the Lincoln movie, uh, which was recorded by Chicago Symphony in Symphony Hall in Chicago. He was there at the sessions. He does all the music editing. He's talking to us um, about the huge, gigantic job that that was. Oh, here's a jam band from Boulder. Jam bands are a big thing in Colorado, especially in Boulder. And uh, when a jam band comes in, they typically decorate the studio before the session starts. So the whole studio was done with the potted plant. They brought that, the tapestries. Uh, if you love uh, Fish and the Grateful Dead and Mo and bands like that, that's what's happening here. The ambiance is very exact cool. same thing happened to me last year. <laughs> yeah. I think there was some incense, which is against the rules. But by the time I came in, it was too late. The whole place sound, uh, smelled like Nag Champa. That's uh, Megan Letts's uh, service dog. Um, no dogs allowed unless you have a note from a doctor. This is that showcase again. There's Megan on stage. This is the uh, recording rig that we brought from Lamont. You're looking at 24 channels of um, uh, Midas microphone preamps and an interface, uh, some more preamps, a Pro Tools rig that we brought out. Uh, so this was the audio recording rig for that gig. This is the remote video truck. Um, we had a, a big donation that year and we spent $10,000 on this event. And part of that went to a video contractor who assembled a remote video uh, control room and parked it outside. This is like a big panel truck where he bolted all the equipment up. Uh, this guy is switching a multi-camera um, video shoot of uh, the bands that I told you about. This is uh, Studio B. It looks a little different than this now. This is a mixing and mastering room. Uh, there's no recording room attached to it, but as you saw, we can record in either of these studios from any of the rehearsal spaces in the building. So I've run uh, jazz big band sessions here. Uh, this room looks pretty much the same as you see here. Uh, the acoustics in this room are fantastic. Uh, it's a remarkably accurate mixing and mastering room. There's the bass player in, uh, I think he's the guy in the jam band. Took his shoes off. Uh, you can tell by his armband there that he's in jam band. Uh, close miking of a guitar amp. Uh, this guy is doing some mixing again. Uh, <laughs> this is the transition period, I think, when that little controller went away and the giant console is sitting there now. So he's got an empty table, but there's a, um, a big API analog board now instead. Another shot of Brandon, uh, isolation room, guitar player. Classical session in the concert hall, we did um, uh, a string quartet recording, oh, a string quartet overdub for a popular music song that uh, a Lamont student had written 
So this is a string quartet wearing headphones, listening to a click track and the pre-recorded uh, rock band tracks and they are overdubbing uh, string parts. This is a field trip to Blasting Room Studios up in um, uh, uh, where, Longmont, where are they? Fort Collins, Fort Collins. Uh, this is a, uh, a studio that's run by the drummer from Black Flag, the great uh, punk band. Um, these guys have won, oh, they've got some platinum and gold records, I do believe. They have recorded some major names there, at least like String Cheese Incident. There's another jam band. They, they did some recording here. We uh, booked the studio and brought a Lamont band up and spent the day recording. We had them record our band. That's a giant SSL mixing console there. And their um, co-owner there uh, did the recording for us, talked us through the whole thing. We got to observe, we got to participate. Uh, it was uh, really, really fun. And the recording turned out great. Blasting Room Studios. Uh, another shot of Blast Room. This, by the way, was an uh, analog two-inch reel-to-reel tape recorder um, feeding Pro Tools. It's a complicated setup. This stuff goes on to the analog reel-to-reel -reel first to get that sound, comes off in real time, goes to Pro Tools. And this studio, they don't mix in Pro Tools. They use Pro Tools as a tape recorder and playback machine. All the mixing, all the compression and EQ is done in analog on the board and with the outboard equipment. Pro Tools is just playing back the tracks. Um, that's the, uh, this is in a different studio. We went to a uh, Rocky Mountain Recorders is a studio in town. It's a fabulous studio that was built in the late seventies to do music. And they quickly found out that they could charge three, four times as much money to do corporate voiceover work. So very little music gets done there. Um, they charge their clients like two to $300 an hour. It's mostly corporate. And part of the thing is that they've got like a cocktail set up there and, and we didn't partake, but uh, corporate clients will sit there and mix themselves a Sazerac or, or something. And uh, this is the studio. This is Rocky Mount Recorders uh, Studio A. They similar to the thing we did at the blasting room, they do mostly uh, sound for pictures. So this is one of their staff engineers demonstrating the workflow for us for um, uh, sound, sound effects and music bed for a, uh, for a corporate video. So just an idea of some of the things that are going on in and out of house here. Well, thanks so much for giving us that little tour. That was really great. Thank you for that behind the scenes look. Um, all right, well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, if um, if you, are you guys uh, willing to share your emails? If anyone has any questions, go ahead and put those in the chat if you'd like. Um, and mine, mine is in there as well. So um, thank you all so much for joining us for this webinar. It was really great to um, kind of have a, a deep dive into what it's like to be a student in this program. Um, a reminder that the application deadline is tomorrow. So um, if you have any questions, do, do not hesitate to reach out. Um, so thanks everyone for, for joining us tonight and have a great night. Bye.